and welcome to In The Lab. This is our final session today as part of World Space Week and we are going to do some questions on the topic of a miscellaneous mishmash. And that is because it's a whole load of questions that didn't really fit into a topic oh, okay. or the questions came in a bit late and they did fit in, but we didn't fit them in. So okay. there you go, a bit of a mishmash. Nice. And you might be thinking, why, oh why, am I dressed as a judge? It's because I'm going to judge your answers today, Mr. Wilson. Oh, uh, okay, fair yes. enough. I hadn't, so, even, I hadn't even noticed before. You did notice. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I, I am a very flamboyant yes. character. Yeah. So the first question, is going to come from Nora, who we've had questions from before, mm -hmm. so her yeah. questions are quite interesting. Ah, quite a basic one this time. Which galaxy in the universe is the largest? Ah, um, good question. I uh, do admit I had to look this one up, because um, I wasn't sure myself. Uh, so it goes by the designation of IC1101. Right. So um, yeah, with lots of stars and like planets and galaxies, as we sort of like find loads of them, we sort of stop giving them sort of standardized names and use designations for them. So IC1101 is the largest galaxy that we found. It's made of a hundred trillion stars. Right. Uh, it is 50 times the size of the Milky Way and 2000 times the mass, I believe. So it's a lot heavier, a lot bigger, and has a lot more stars. Right, I judge that answer to be acceptable but I don't like the name of the galaxy. So no, neither do I. Unacceptable. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah. Guilty. Yes, so. I agree. Right, next question from Aaron. Mm. How can tardigrades live in space? Now, you might be thinking, what on earth is a tardigrade? Yes. Well, here is a picture of a tardigrade. It's coming on the screen now. Yep. And look at the state of that. That is massive. I love this. It's like They're an alien so cool. creature. They are so cool. How, how big is that? So a, uh, a tardigrade, also known as a small water bear, because they kind of look a bit like a bear. I don't know if right. you can see that in the photo, but okay. I think they look a little bit like a bear. Yep. Um, however, they're, they're about a millimetre long. Oh, right. Uh, they go from about 0.5 millimetres, about one, just over 1.2 millimetres long, I think is the longest we get for a tardigrade. Um, and they are incredible. They are, they are seemingly indestructible uh, creatures, if not, some people think even immortal. They're not quite like that, but they're pretty good. Um, so what is amazing about tardigrade is they are the only living life form that has been exposed to the harsh vacuum of space. They've right. done this at the International Space Station. They brought them back inside and the, the creatures are totally fine. The tardigrades are seemingly okay. Um, so basically they go into a deep state of what's called cryptobiosis. Right. Uh, so basically what they do is they it's like a really deep hibernation, sort of like, sort of like a cryogenic sleep. They basically shut themselves down. They get rid of 95% of their body's water. They just get rid of it. Just because obviously water means that's what's it activating the process. They just slow all of their body processes all the way down. Yeah. And they just happily sleep. They just hibernate. Yeah, just so hibernate. Ages. Bit like what we do in the summer holidays. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Except I couldn't do that in space, I don't think. No, probably not. Um, yeah, I judge that to be a good answer. Um, could we have tardigrades in this room, maybe? Could they be here? Um, that's a good question. I think possibly. There is, there is a worry that they are becoming slightly more endangered uh, due to other, other factors. Some people sending them into space. Yeah, possibly. exactly. From the people just uprooting them and throwing them into the cosmos. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, I say, say, I, I'm not entirely sure with uh, oh. how many tardigrades we'd have in this room. Interesting. Well, just in case, let's just get rid of them if they're in this room. Oh, no, they're endangered. Look after them. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, I'd say, yeah. <laughs> So, next question. It's from Nora again. Oh, okay. We love our Nora questions. Uh, what is the most common force in space? Mm, um, so, again, I think it's an answer we've had quite a lot this week, uh, which comes down to gravity. Yeah. Uh, so, again, in space, everything is so spread out. There's so much gaps between things that gravity is the only real thing that still sort of persists at such a long range. Things like the strong and weak nuclear forces, yeah. they dissipate. The electromagnetic force would still be around as well. However, there's not necessarily going to be as many interactions as we get with gravity things, mm. pulling uh, galaxies around, pulling stars and planets into, into alignment sort of thing. So yeah, gravity and probably uh, the electromagnetic force would be the two ones that you'd still get at an infinitely long range. But I like it. I like it. I'm judging your answer as good again. You're getting a lot of these. I'm doing all right. This is okay. This is okay. Yeah. Well done, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Next question from Callum. Now, this is a question I never would have thought of. Mm. If everything ends, everything, okay. everything, absolutely everything, what colour would the world be? Hmm. Well, you've got the classic sort of like uh, philosophical idea of if like if nobody's there to observe it, then is there a colour? 
to understand if that makes sense. So the classic case of a, yeah. if a tree falls in the woods and nobody's around, does it make a noise? And, and no light, yeah, no colour. Exactly, so yeah. yeah, so that's the other thing. If everything does end, you've got no light, so the suggestion would be black, would be my interpretation. I guess you probably could make a similar argument for white, um, just because if everything is together, there's nothing there around sort of thing. There's nothing there to absorb. If there is any light left around, because all the light will be absorbed, but my guess would probably be black. Mm. I'm going to judge that as vague but acceptable. Vague but yeah. acceptable, yeah, yeah I'd agree with that. Fair. Yeah. From Abigail, the next question is this. How does the moon... We haven't had a question about the moon at all no, so far. Wow. No. How does the moon control our weather? Ooh, interesting. Um, so, the moon... Uh, lovely little, lovely little chap. Um, orbits around our Earth every 28 days. Uh, and... Its main contribution on the Earth is its effects on the tides. Yeah. Like as the the moon goes around, it basically uh, the gravity of the moon pulls on the water that we have and pulls it around um, the ocean, sort of thing. And that's what gives us the tides going in and going out, sort of thing. The tidal effect is caused uh, by the moon. So obviously there is other inclement weather things that will happen, like wind and stuff like that, not necessarily caused by the moon uh, and like by, but in conjunction you can get a situation where you could get a really bad tropical storm with a combination of the tides and weather if, and other weather effects like the wind mm. so it's not directly being influenced by the moon but there's a fringed case where I reckon you could have that but again not necessarily a sort of like a, uh, a meteorologist or not really a sort of like a weather person so not entirely sure but my answer would be it affects the tides don't know about anything else. I reckon there'd be some influences if there was some very stormy seas and a tide and tidal influence as well. You could say the moon was a bit of play. Okay, I'm going to judge that answer as ebbing and flowing. Ebbing and flowing. Fair yeah, in say. and out. In and out. We have a question from Aiden who asks: Do black holes make time travel possible? Um, well, we had we had a good discussion about this uh, the other day, talking about time, mm. uh, talking about black holes, and uh, again, time travel is always an interesting, fa and always an interesting factor that people think, like to think about. Yeah. Um, my favourite thing is the fact that well, we're all always time travelling. Like true. everybody's time travelling. We're time travelling right now. You're time travelling right there um, because we are. Well, we're all just travelling forwards in time. Yeah. When we're building time travel, they usually think, well, can we go backwards? In can time? we go backwards? Can we go the other way? Um, again. It's something that Stephen Hawking theoretically proposes an idea with like the merging and the, the forming of black holes um, and what you happen to be on the event horizon. But as you get closer towards a black hole, people would observe you as seeming to slow down because of the way that gravity would affect you, it would seem that you are actually slowing down. If I was to be at a safe distance watching you, you would appear to slow down and then stop. So effectively, you'd slow down your time by some significant margin from my perspective. But from your perspective, it looked like everything else would speed up rapidly um, because obviously from your perspective, time is time. So it'd be uh, more amazing if a black hole could actually make time travel impossible, if it could stop traveling that's what through it's, time. That's what it you're sort of seemingly seems to do. Yeah. that's what we can't do. Yeah. No one can do that. We're just traveling through time. Yes. Interesting. Okay, uh, another question from Katie this time. Okay. How was Jupiter formed as it's a gas planet? And I can see where they're, where they're coming from. Yeah, a yeah. Load of gas, why would a load of gas just clump together? We know it diffuses, so yeah. what's going on? No, exactly. So again, it's the same um, when we sort of like think about the traditional sort of like formation of the solar system. It's, again, gravity comes into play. Mm. Um, when the sort of the solar system was formed from like a sort of like a planetary nebula sort of thing, the sort the center, and then all the other gas and dust that was around started to collect itself under, under gravity, pulling itself together. And that's again what holds it together. So when Jupiter was formed about four and a half billion years ago, it was all just things being pulled together by gravity and sitting uh, nicely together. So gravity is what pulls it together, gravity what keeps it together, because there's nothing really pushing it apart. There's no need for it to go any further out because it's like at the edges of its, of its, mm. of its expanse. So pretty much most of our questions all this week could be answered by gravity in some sense. Yeah, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big uh, thing to understand for space and gravity. However, that cannot be the answer to our very last question. Okay. Because someone has asked, <laughs> Can we organise a school trip to the Space Museum in Leicester? Now, I thought this was you slipping this question in. Mm, I, well, I, I, I may have urged this question forward, possibly, by suggesting it as an, as an idea. The truth is out. Yeah, the truth yeah. is out. Yeah. Um, so I, I would very much like to go. We right. have in the past done trips to George Will Bank, we which we are looking to get going again in the future, where possible. Yeah. Um, but also that we have the National Space Museum is in Leicester. 
which is not that far away. Um, so I would be, obviously, would recommend anybody to, uh, anybody to go visit those sort of uh, museums. That's true. You also have the Museum of Science and Industry in um, Manchester. Yeah. That has lots of links as well. So like I say, and Jordan Banks not so far away. So like I say, yeah, get out there and see all these other amazing museums. And NASA in America, in Florida. Yes, which is very good. Yeah. I can confirm, having been there a couple of times, can confirm it's very, very enjoyable. It's not a weekend trip, but if you're there, go yes, to if you're, yes. Disneyland, forget it. Go to NASA. Yes, absolutely. Kennedy Space Center. I'm going to judge that as a great answer because it certainly was. Yes. And that brings us, I think, almost to the end, except for our favourite feature, the question you are unprepared for, and that <laughs> is, ask Mr. Wilson. like this. Last question. Last question. The first person in space was... Yuri Gagarin. That's not the question. Okay, that sorry. That is the premise to the question. Ah, uh, easy. Ah, it was an easy one. I, I fooled you. It was you a cosmonaut. I fooled you into that. But the question is this. How old was he when he went? How old was Yuri Gagarin? Yeah. Okay. And this is back in the... Is it early 60s or late 50s? Uh, yeah, so yeah, like yeah early 60s. Yeah, yeah. The early 60s. How old was he when he went? How old was he when yeah. he went? So he was a cosmonaut for the uh, Soviet... Uh, I think it was the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah Soviet Union, yeah, USSR. Yeah. USSR. Um, I'm trying to think how long... I'm, this, is, this is just going to be a guess now. It's a complete guess. Um, right? so you can't work this one out. This is just no, a no, no, it's just, just a guess. I was just going to start throwing in more random facts I know about the USSR. Uh, just, 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 just a filibuster. Um, so, right, I'm just going to make a guess. I'm going to guess he was going to be in his 20s, because he wouldn't be too young. He would have been, because he was a trained sort of like fighter pilot, he'd have been in the military, he'd been military trained. So he'd have been in his 20s, but not like prime 20s, because they'll want someone with some experience and someone that is like brave enough to sit on top of an unknown rocket. I'm going to go late 20s, I'm going to go 26, 26. That's not a bad guess. It's wrong, uh, but that's because it's very hard to get the exact Yeah, answer. yeah, yeah, I was guessing like, yeah. late, the answer, is it late 20s. The answer is 27. Oh, so you oh. were very close. I'm going to let you have that because that was incredibly close. Oh. So that means that a lot of people watching these videos um, could actually be astronauts or cosmonauts. Yes. If they go to Russia, that's really the only difference mainly. Yep. Um, they could be that within about 10 years of leaving school or less. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So it's quite a quick thing really, uh, quite a massive career progression there. Yes. So well done, great answer. And I hope everybody you've enjoyed yes. watching these five sessions of questions that we have done this week. Make sure you tune in to future videos of In The Lab. Woo! See you later. Bye now.